Hi, it's Dr. Z. In this video, I will review one-tailed hypothesis tests. By the end of this video, you'll be able to explain the difference between one-tailed and two-tailed tests and conduct a one-tailed hypothesis test using a z-score for a single sample x. Please print the corresponding handout for this video and feel free to pause the video at any time to take notes on the handout. Recall that hypothesis is just a fancy word for prediction. Well, there are actually two types of hypotheses. Which one you choose will determine whether you conduct a one-tailed or a two-tailed hypothesis test. A two-tailed test is the first hypothesis that you learned how to do. This test uses a non-directional hypothesis. The prefix non means not or unknown. In other words, we do not know in what direction the sample will go. The treatment given to the sample may increase or decrease the effect of the sample. Basically, we use a non-directional hypothesis when we do not know how the treatment will impact the sample. The two-tailed test is the most common test used, especially with new research. The null and research hypothesis will be the same as in the previous video. Now, if it's not obvious yet, the critical region for this test will be in both tails, since we do not know which direction the effect will be. On the other hand, a one-tailed test uses a directional hypothesis. The root word direction implies that we have an idea of which the direction the treatment will affect the sample. The hypothesis will specify either an increase or decrease in the sample score. By now, you should probably see the pattern that the critical region for this test will be in one tail, as specified by the hypotheses. Now, for a quick review, this diagram illustrates the process of hypothesis testing. We will use the same four steps in conducting a one-tailed hypothesis test, with some modifications along the way. Step one, the yellow Lego, is to state hypotheses. Since we are using directional hypotheses instead of non-directional, we will have our first modifications in this step. Writing directional hypotheses are especially confusing to students. To make them easier, it is important that you write the research hypothesis first, then the null hypothesis will be easier to write afterward. Recall that the research hypothesis is predicting that a difference will happen. In a directional hypothesis, we are predicting that we know in which direction this difference will happen. The research hypothesis would be written like this. Insert treatment refers to writing in the specific treatment given as part of the study. Since we're predicting the direction, you will indicate either an increase or a decrease and XX refers to what we're studying. Again, it's important that you clearly state that a sample is being compared with a population. In notation, there will be two options based on the direction that is hypothesized. The first notation here indicates that there will be an increase. In other words, the sample will be greater than the population mean or the value of mu. The second notation predicts that there will be a decrease. In other words, the sample will be less than mu. Here comes the easy part. The null hypothesis is just the complete opposite of the research hypothesis. Basically, we're saying that there will not be an increase or a decrease as specified from the research hypothesis. In notation, the null hypothesis will look just like the H1 notation, but the sign will be opposite, using, using either less than or equal to, or greater than or equal to. I understand. <laughs> this may be difficult to comprehend right now. Please wait for the lecture example at the end of the video for clarification. Step two, the blue Lego, is to set the criteria to make a decision 
where the study worked or not. First, we will set our significance level P. We will use either a 0.05 significance level or 0.01. Now that we know our P, we need to find the critical value or critical region that tells us what the sample should look like if the study worked. We will use P and the normal curve table to find the Z, but here's our another modification for one tail only. The next slide will demonstrate why the critical region for 0.05 significance level is always Z equals plus 1.64 or Z equals minus 1.64 one tailed. Let's graph what the critical region Z would look like. Using a normal distribution, where will the one outlier be located? Since it's a directional hypothesis, it will either be in one tail or the other tail. So either above the mean or below the mean. If we selected the significance level of 0.05, then we're referring to 5%. Since we're only using one tail, the 5% stays in that one tail. Using 5% in the tail, the normal curve table states that the corresponding z-score is a 1.64. So if the hypothesis is predicting an increase, then the critical region would be z equals plus 1.64. On the other hand, if the hypothesis is predicting a decrease, then the critical region would be z equals minus 1.64. I encourage you to pause the video and look this up yourself in the normal curve table. Step three, the red Lego, is to collect data and calculate sample statistics. This step stays the same as it would for a two-tailed test. You will calculate the z-score for the sample using the formula provided in the video for a two-tailed hypothesis test. Step four, the green Lego, is making a decision about whether the study worked or not. This step also stays the same as it would for a two-tailed hypothesis test. Please see Canvas for the video and example handout that explains these two decisions if you need a review. Well, now that we reviewed the steps of a one-tailed hypothesis test, are you ready to practice your new knowledge? I have one practice example for you to review. This is a short summary of the four steps that we just described above. Please note that these steps are for a one-tailed hypothesis test using z-scores. There are two modifications noted in bold. Please pause the video to write down these steps on the video handout. This lecture example wants to know if blueberry supplements can improve cognitive function. The word improve implies that we're predicting an increase in cognitive function. In other words, we're using a directional hypothesis. The details of this research study are also provided in your video handout. We know what the adult population scores on a cognitive test. Since we cannot study the entire adult population, we have one patient take blueberry supplements for six months, and then we compare this one patient to the population. I encourage you to pause the video here and try to do the four steps on your own first on your video handout. Then resume the video to show the answers. Step one, since we're studying if there is an increase on cognitive function, the directional hypotheses will reflect that wording. Since the treatment in this study was the blueberry supplement, I shorten it to BBS. The research hypothesis will reflect that there is an increase. In notation, if the sample will have an increase compared to the population, then the, then the sample <laughs> should be greater than or equal to mu, which is 80. Now, for the null hypothesis, the wording will be the complete opposite of the research hypothesis. So there will not be an increase in cognitive functioning. And in notation, well, we just flip the sign that we use for the research hypothesis. 
Therefore, if the sample will not have an increase compared to the population, then the sample should be less than or equal to mu, which is 80. Step two. As the researcher, we get to decide the significance level. And the preferred one is 0 0.05. Since we are predicting an increase in cognitive functioning, we need to draw a critical region Z for one tail. And this tail is for above the mean. The corresponding z-score for a 0.05 significance level, one tail, is z equals plus 1.64. The box indicates the final answer that I will be looking for on a problem set and an exam. Step 3. This step is the same as for a two-tail test. We use the modified z-score formula that allows us to compare our sample x-score with mu and sigma. We calculate using the values given to us, and the z-score for our one patient is z equals plus 1.75. The box indicates the final answer that I'll be looking for on problem sets and exams. Step 4. Now we need to compare the sample z-score that we calculated in step 3 to the prediction that we determined in step 2. In other words, does the z equals plus 1.75 fall in the critical region z from step 2? Well, since plus 1.75 is above the mean in the tail, way past z equals plus 1.64, the answer is yes. Then the decision is to reject the null hypothesis. The box indicates the final answer that I'll be looking for on a problem set and exams. Overall, it looks pretty good for blueberry supplements. More specifically, since the z-score for the sample was a plus, which is above the mean, it looks like cognitive functioning increased. After a hypothesis test is conducted, the researcher must always report and interpret the results of their study. Please see Canvas for the video and example handout that reviews the summary interpretation statements for this practice example. In summary, researchers use, a, use directional hypotheses when they have an idea of which direction the treatment will affect the sample. Then researchers conduct a one-tailed hypothesis test to determine the results of the study. Learning how to conduct a one-tailed hypothesis test is one more major LEGO building block needed to understand statistics.